Welcome everyone to the Garden Nerd Tip of the Week podcast, where garden nerds from around the world talk shop, share stories, and offer their favorite tip. I'm your host, Christy Wilhelmy. On the podcast this week, we're chatting with Chris McLaughlin about her new book, The Good Garden. It's about how to nurture pollinators, soil, native wildlife, and healthy food all in your own backyard. Chris is a master gardener and the author of nine books, and she lives on a farm in Northern California. Welcome to the podcast, Chris. Thank you for having me. I'm really glad we're in the same time zone. I don't usually talk to people in the same time zone. I agree with you. I almost never do. Almost yeah. never. So yeah, that's great. I knew I wanted to talk to you the moment I saw the first image in your book, which is you standing in or perhaps behind, but it looks like you're standing in a waist high pile of mulch. And I thought, yep, got to talk to this woman. <laughs> Let's start with your garden. Where in Northern California are you located and what makes up your garden or farm? Uh, basically, we're in, we're kind of tucked into the Northern California foothills. So we're about an hour uh, past Sacramento. And then an hour up the hill would be Lake Tahoe. So oh. kind of in the middle, sort of right in the, right in the foothills, which is great. And um, we, on our farm, we have grown pretty much everything you can think of. Um, and we raise colored Angora goats, which is, uh, they produce mohair fiber. And we shear those every six months. And that that produces, you know, mohair and you can sell it or spin it into yarn or whatever but um and they do a great job with a fire hazard you know california is like we're like fire happy here and mm -hmm. happy is not the great word but um <laughs> but mostly i'm really focused on um we always have vegetables flowers you know fruit trees all the stuff but i also really focus on um incorporating you know caring for the ecosystem and the wildlife i'm a big wildlife fanatic um but I, you know, which is part of the reason for this book is that right. I love the wildlife, but I also want my stuff. I want my carrots and I want my veggies and I, I want that, but I also don't want to stop anything else from surviving where and how it should. So we do different, you know, things that are environmentally friendly, but maybe help us. Um, everything, if we don't want deer coming in and eating every single thing <laughs> we have to fence it that's uh -huh. just life you know and no amount of um anything else is going to work it works for a little while you know people talk about you know spraying some of the plants and stuff with the deer resistant spray and i tell you that works until it doesn't work yep. and you know and so if you're really determined to have your goods you got to get that huge fence up and so instead of um we're on five acres which isn't really that huge um, but still it's a lot. If you wanted to seven, uh, fence it with seven feet tall fencing, That's that would a lot. be a bit of money. <laughs> so we just kind of leave it at, it's like five foot fencing and then just the, the veggie parts and stuff, um, and the fruit trees and things we do have to fence in just those guys. Um, we do plant a lot of native plants that sometimes they nibble on a little bit, but they almost never entirely wipe that kind of stuff out. So, mm -hmm. you know, so there's always this great balance going on. So the farm is like really like this, you know, it's a it's a it's a mishmash of every single thing we can think of. We go, oh, I want to grow that, you know. So it's nice. Really, and yeah. what is technically your hardiness zone? Um, nine B, I believe. Okay. And yeah. so you you get some chill, uh, and I do being inland, you you maybe get a frost. So you have uh what kind of fruit trees do you have growing? Um, we have plums, we have apricots, we have cherry, we have um, uh, the little clementine little dudes. Um, what did we just plant? We just planted a Meyer lemon because we lost a Meyer lemon. Uh -huh. um, we have a pomegranate, we have um, fig, we have, you mm. know. All have, the good stuff, yeah. The thing is, is that going back to the weather, we actually, um, we get a lot more than frost. So this year we had snow. Ah. Um, one time we got a nice little, little snow. We do get lots of hail, lots of freezing. We mm -hmm. freeze a lot of the time in the winter time. Um, so we protect some plants, you know, with things during that, um, some things are much hardier, as you know, that they can take that and actually like that, like the apple trees, they're fine. 
Um, so just the different, you know, we just kind of play it by ear. This year has been really weird. It has. California. Yeah, we're we're bizarre this year. I don't know what's happening. Yeah. So yeah, I, I mean, we've got so much water and rain and up higher in the in the hills. We've got all this snow and we're crazy. So um, but it's still a great growing zone. I mean, it yeah. really is. We we pull off almost anything we want, really. That sounds really appealing. And five acres, I know you said isn't very much for you, but for those of us who live in the city, it's an enormous amount of play, of space. Do you have is there do you back up against the woods or anything? Or are you pretty much out in an urban or a, a suburban environment? Well, at, yeah, at this point, we're yeah, we're a little bit more like we're almost like the farmland right outside suburbia. Okay. So we're pretty close to that. You can't mm. hear much going on. Um, the neighbors are anywhere from you know, five acres away from us to 10 acres away from us. So they're kind of just, you know, spread out. Yeah. So love it. And I know. And it's so funny. Like when you say like five acres sounds like a lot. And I'll tell you, it is like, you know, like you said, when you're in a regular neighborhood, it totally is. But when you're out here, you start to go, oh, this isn't enough. It's not enough room. No, no, no. I never enough. Yeah. You know, and so you get a little greedy, you know, because you right. think all these things you can do, you start to get a little nuts, you know. Yeah. <laughs> understood well yeah. you you've been gardening for 40 years and it's it's I saw in your bio that you've lived on five farms so let's talk about this approach like what's been your approach at the beginning when you get the land and decide to to develop it or or you know flesh it out yeah well you know I mean mostly we work with whatever um the land has all been different and that is one of the beautiful things about the northern California foothills um the land is so different depending on what you know where you're at in the spot and so we like to work with a lot of that you know when we have a lot of outcroppings rock outcroppings we don't have a lot here we did at our last house we like to add a lot of the um you know the, the little alpine things and you know succulents and things that would kind of go with that look and you then you're starting to create this whole garden that looks like this and at this place, we haven't really done that because it, it hasn't really lended itself to that. So here is interesting because in the front is a whole lot of sunshine. There's dappled stuff, but a lot of sunshine. So all the flowers, the veggies, we create these big areas, um, you know, for the herbs and then for the veggies and flowers. And then towards the back, though, we have all these, we have like an oak forest. Ah. So it, yeah, it's like, and there's like this natural little creek that's only seasonal, but it looks like a little old gully. And, you know, and so right now I'm trying to get camellias and stuff back there because of the shade. So we always just take the land to kind of go with what, you know, what that feels like, what it wants to be. Mm -hmm. And so, and we kind of go with that. And then, and then, you know, you go down, like you know, this rabbit hole of discovering even more of those types of, you know, the hellbores we put in, you know, um, you know, um, ferns, things like that, where all of a sudden you go, wow, this is like the opposite of a giant cutting flower garden. You've got this beautiful forest look and thing. So the only thing we really tend to stay away from is anything that um, we always make sure we look up and make sure it's not invasive. Mm -hmm. That's like really important to us. Um, it's okay if it's not uh, native, but we don't want it invasive. It's sort of, that's sort of two different thoughts entirely. So we stay away from that. Understood. Yeah. And mm -hmm. The Good Garden, your book, it has a lot of basics for gardeners who are just getting started, as well as some more advanced ideas like biodynamics. It's funny because your book is set up in the, a lot of the ways that I set up my book, Gardening for Geeks. And I was like, oh my gosh, so we're going to have a lot, a lot to talk about. Um, now, you, I, I'm sort of jumping ahead because yeah. we there's so much you cover in this book, but I was flipping through and saw you list a recipe for biodynamic plant tea. Can we talk about that? What is it yeah, and sure. what are the benefits? Yeah, sure. And there is, there's a lot in the book and, um, and, the, and just to, to go back to the fact that there is a lot in the book, what <laughs> I really did, well, what I really did was it's not like it's a tome, you know what I mean? Um, but I wanted to introduce people to all the different ways they could try yeah. you know, to, to work with nature and to work with all this stuff. You don't have to do everything. You don't have to be everything to everyone to everything. But these ideas give you a place where when when the readers look at it, they can go, 
that really appeals to me. I like the idea of biodynamic gardening or no-till gardening or whatever it might be, French intensive. And, and all of those things will get you to the same place, but just in your own style. So that's why a lot was crammed in there, but I don't get overly deep. I do give a lot of resources. So, but anyway, yeah. Um, so as far as the, um, you know, the, the biodynamic tea. So basically what you're doing is you're getting like a netted bag and you're putting in some finished compost that's already all broken down and lovely. And you're putting in a bunch of nettles, which, um, you know, you would have to have gloves on. If they're the stinging nettles, you're going to want to do that. Or you can, you can actually cook them down a tiny bit and it will get rid of that, those spiky nettles. Right. But I would just use gloves because I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of lazy. I've been doing a lot of uh, <laughs> blogging about stinging nettles lately because they're all over my yard right now. And I've been cooking with them and yeah. letting people know like yellow dish gloves, the rubber dish gloves. That's your best friend when sandling. Right. Nettles. Oh yeah. Ouch. Yeah. Cause wham, well, and they poke you. Mm, no fun. Um, yeah. And then, you know, adding comfrey and you're putting it into a five gallon bucket and it's filled with, you know, halfway or two thirds up to the top with untreated water. And you might use like a burlap or something over the top of it. And basically you can just soak this. You know, it's so funny. For many years, I would soak this stuff and let it sit for days and kind of stir it around and stuff. But then later I started seeing how people were using the little air pumps, the aquarium mm -hmm. air pumps with the tubing. And I thought that was much cooler because it kind of brings all of that bacteria and stuff to life, you know, and right. uh, works better than me just stirring it. And, and yeah, and then you go water your plants and stuff and it's just, it's, it's, it's healthy. It's, um, and like you're talking about when you have it all over your yard, you've got the net, right? I mean, you're like, you could be super angry or you could go, well, I have a wealth of nettles and you could be using them in a biodynamic way. I mean, you know, mother nature uses all of this on her own. And if we kind of pay attention, we can also be using all of it and, um, and so, yeah, that's just one of the ways I, I do this with just plain compost tea. I do it with uh, worm castings, ah. just worm casting tea in the same way. Mm -hmm. I do like whatever I have on hand. I, you know, kind of do it that way. And it's, it's fabulous stuff. So nice. I think a lot of people would be interested. And I, I think there are a couple of different kinds of comfrey out there and there are some that are more preferred by biodynamic farmers and gardeners than others. Right, um, right. I'm not sure of the specifics of those plants. To be honest, um, I've always just whatever comfrey we have growing, I haven't really thought to myself, well, I'd rather plant this one. We originally started growing comfrey for our pair our uh, rabbits. Ah. Um, yeah, when they're not feeling well and stuff, and we would give them some comfrey and stuff. So I kind of went that direction and I never really thought to myself, well, what would the biodynamics prefer? So I I, to be honest, couldn't speak on which one they prefer, but we just use <laughs> yeah, whatever. So. Yeah, whatever works, right? Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, we we talk a lot on this podcast about building your ecosystem because the garden is so much more than just planter beds. And outside of building healthy soil, the above ground ecosystem is also really, really important. And you write a lot about this in the book and you also talk about what it takes to create a certified wildlife habitat if if somebody wanted to turn their garden into a space like that what would they need to do well you know um for one you can go online to the national wildlife federation and they it's really cool because they have a whole checklist for you um once you complete that checklist you enter all your information in and they send you a nice little certificate saying that, you know, this is like, you know, what your garden is. Um, in my case, I went ahead and bought the plaque because I put that in front of my property. I, I want, because my idea always, and you know, when you read the book, you'll see, I really, it's important to me to be, um, to include the community. So mm -hmm. I want to let them know. And then they kind of go, well, what's that? What, what is she doing over here? And they can check that out. And so I always talk about you know, letting your neighbors know different things and including them and stuff. Anyway, so basically what you're really looking for is you don't want to use any pesticides because obviously you're not trying to kill the things in there that will either be good for the garden or good for other critters, you know, like birds. If you kill off all the, all the little creepy crawlers that are eating your plants, if you poison them all, well, the birds also have no food. So aside from the fact you could poison other things, 
the birds also just, you just kill them and they're, you know, you're not inviting birds at that point. So you're not going to use pesticides or herbicides, but the other main things too, is that you're providing food in your garden for them. And it's not just uh, like you're picturing, well, my vegetable garden is food, but it's not really like that. It's a little more like letting some things go to seed, you know, letting your sunflowers produce sunflower seeds and letting them sit there and dry. And oh my goodness, in the fall, these beautiful birds, we, and we have like so many goldfinch and stuff, and they sit there and they eat that and it dawns on you, oh, that's why I don't want to cut away everything because these guys, you know, so you're going to provide food in some ways, you want to provide some kind of shelter. So those might be like, you could, you know, create a hedgerow um, along your property with different size hedges and stuff of like evergreens and mixed with evergreens and deciduous shrubs and trees and for animals to rear their young in or hide from predators and that thing. Or you can even build now here on my property. I mean, and there are differences here on my property. I can do things like leave a big pile of wood cuttings, you know, mm -hmm. just like, like, and the frogs hide in there and then the squirrels hide in there and all these things. But maybe, you know, in your suburban house, maybe your neighbors wouldn't appreciate seeing like a pile or whatever. So you mm -hmm. would do that differently. You might put up um, mason bee houses you know, for them, instead of like putting out reeds laying there for mason bees, you may put up a cute little house and it's serving the same purpose, but it's adorable. And nobody thinks like, oh, your yard looks so whatever. So I always try to, you know, especially when you're living in a suburban or urban area, there are ways to do everything you want to do, but also sort of be respectful and mindful of the people around you. And honestly, when you act that way, they often come ask you about it. Cause now they go, well, that's really cute and cool. What's this about? So, you know, um, you know, when you go to certify your yard and you have these things in place, it may not be obvious to people, but then you have your little sign and stuff and people ask you, well, what's going on here? So you can get your neighbors involved and create like a giant habitat because everybody's doing it. So, yeah, I've had that exact thing happen where we don't have a sign out front or anything, but my neighbor across the street, she was always outside spraying weed killer and pesticides and herbicides on everything. Right. And then she she came across the street one day and was noticing there were butterflies and birds and insects fluttering around everywhere. And she's like, why is it like that just across the street? And my husband happened to be outside at the time when she showed up and he explained to her our philosophy about stewarding wildlife and not using pesticides and she immediately started making changes to her front yard and I was like Isn't wow that's wonderful. so impressive I, I had a, I had an experience very similar to that uh, not so much with the pesticides and stuff but you know I was moving actually and the day we were moving the trucks are outside everything we're getting ready to leave and I was the only person with a vegetable garden out front uh -huh. and no one had ever really said anything I mean no one seemed upset about it but they also kind of just walked by and went, okay, whatever. Um, and of course I kept it neat, you know, what have you. But when we were leaving, my neighbor across the street came over and said, before you leave, come over here. I'm like, okay. So we walked over there and she said, how did you do that? Oh. And I thought, oh my gosh, I, I, I made an impact. Even if it was on the day I was leaving. Yeah. Like she thought that was neat. She liked the idea and wanted to do it. So it was really nice to, you know, that, doesn't that just feel so much like a win? Just you, it just does. Gratifying, you know. Yeah, because a lot of times I think we we're doing this for ourselves and our families, and we sort of forget about the community piece, uh, especially because in urban environments, particularly, we are all sort of in our in, insular little worlds, and we're you know marked by our borders, and it's sort of hard to feel like there is a ripple effect or an impact outside of our own lives. So it's kind of nice to see when that actually happens. Yeah, right. I know. I know. It's 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 so nice. And yeah, and there's so many ways to to reach out. Mm -hmm. to your community. It might not even be your neighbor. It just might be, you know, in another way, the community gardens or whatever. So Right. Uh, and and so you do speak way. about community in the book. And I, I didn't yeah. I didn't really focus on that part for this conversation, but it's it's all in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah and and great. one of the things that you've got in the book that I really liked was uh 
regarding creating habitats for native pollinators and wildlife, butterfly caterpillars are particularly important because like you said, the birds feed on a lot of them. And right, so you have three whole pages of host plants for caterpillars. Right. Can you share some of your favorites that people might be able to incorporate? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I have on the list, I have the butterfly species. So like you may even have a species that you're interested in having, such as monarch, as we all, everyone wants to do the monarch, right? Um, you know, so you may have something that you really enjoy. And so it has the species and then the host plants. And what a host plant is, is where the eggs would be laid. And those are the plants that the babies are feeding off of, the caterpillars. And then nectar plants aren't necessarily those plants. They might be, it might double up when they're flowering, but the nectar plants are the plants that, um, even though I would say like, you're gonna call all kinds of things in with zinnias and stuff, there are still some plants that um, some of these guys prefer. Um, so, you know, one of my favorite little, little guys, and he's just tiny, he's not one of the huge impressive ones, but the spring azures, they are tiny and they are the most impossible blue. I mean, they are, it's like they're fake. And I just love these little guys. <laughs> and so, <laughs> they're, so dogwoods, viburnum, blueberries, spirea, apple, they lay their eggs on that. So that's a host plant. Um, and then um, what am I thinking? Oh, oh, even though, well, all over the place. And, you know, and also your area, look up butterflies that actually are mostly, you know, do come to your area. Um, painted ladies are like everywhere. And so thistle, daisy, mallows, hollyhocks, burdock. Um, if you have those in your garden, they'll be able to lay their eggs on those and you'll have those. Um, so, you know, we have, um, gosh, we have a ton. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I know. Like I said, it was three whole pages, which yeah. I, you know, I think the, the idea is, and this is something that, uh, in a previous guest, we've had Doug Tallamy on the show, who oh, really goes into that whole idea of the carrying capacity of a plant so that it can serve more than one species and right. not just us, of course. Right. right. Uh, and that's the idea behind these host plants is they're they're providing habitat and or food or a place for, you know, shelter for the butterflies to lay their eggs on, which is great. We want right. that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. A lot of the times originally, you know, many times you, when you think of a butterfly garden, which is like fabulous, who doesn't want a butterfly garden? <laughs> so, but you're really always thinking of those nectar plants. Everything is about what they land on it. Well, because that's when they're beautiful, you know, mm -hmm. and they're these beautiful flying, we call them flying flowers, you know, and they're all <laughs> over and they, you know, and that's what they land on. So you're like, oh, I need a lot of those. But if you want those, you really have to have the host plants and then they're really going to stick around. Those adults aren't going to go so far, you know, so, um, that you know, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it does. I mean, you can do things like plant your native milkweed, not just any milkweed, um, you know, planting na native milkweeds in your area and you can help the monarchs, you know, grow in their numbers, help them on their path to Mexico or, in our case, a lot of ours go over to the end of our coast in California and yeah. they work over there. So um, it's super fun to create this. I'm telling you. And if you put like a little, oh my goodness, I'm so dragonfly happy. You know, you just have like a little water situation in there and, you know, let some little reedy plants go. And then all these beautiful dragonflies and damselflies are everywhere. It's just yeah, you know, it's like heaven, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. It's there just is a beautiful place to be, you know. Yeah, and and there is so much in this book, and you write with such a fun kind of cavalier attitude that helps diffuse a new gardener's fears, which I found oh. really great about it. Um, mm. It's also got sections on growing small fruit trees, raising animals, keeping bees, building communities, which we talked about briefly for a second, mm -hmm. um, and a lot more. I have to ask, what is, was there anything that you learned along the way as you wrote this? You know, there is something that um, I had a basic knowledge of this, but I never really dug into it. And it's just, I know we, we talked about how um, gardening is such a rabbit hole. So my, a big thing for me is no-till gardening. And in fact, that's <laughs> anyway, my tip, but anyway, so the no-till gardening, um, honestly, not disturbing, um, the soil as much as you can is like, honestly is key. And also 
dude, it's the lazy way to go. I mean, I got to tell, I got to tell you, there is nothing worse, you know, <laughs> even if you don't want to talk about messing with the aggregates of the soil or whatever. The fact is you till up that land and I promise you, you will have more weeds there than mm -hmm. you have ever had in your entire life. <laughs> so it's like, why, why are we doing this? But I really think, and I've always thought, you know, for me, no till, because sometimes I also do no dig which I kind of think of as the same thing, which it is in a lot of ways. All of it is about disturbing the soil as little as possible. That's the thing. But no dig in reality is mostly taking the compost, leaving the soil just as it is, laying six or whatever inches of soil uh, compost on the top of that, and then planting in that and leaving it like not digging at all. Mm -hmm. No till, sometimes you will dig a little bit to get, you know, whatever, you know, it's kind of a whole thing. But my point is just that I would consider after I really dug into that research, I would really consider no dig just um, a tie, you know, or no till a type of no dig. It's just sort of, it does go together, but there is sort of a different thing. And so I feel um, like, I wish I would have made that clearer, you know, in the book, because the, the more I got into it and then the book is printed and then I got deeper and deeper into the whole thing. And I went, oh, I wish I would have specified. <laughs> and so I didn't. <laughs> That's what reprints are for and yeah. second editions. Um, yeah. And it it's funny. Well, before we started recording, you had mentioned Charles Doubt. Uh, sorry, Doubting. Yeah, Doubting, yeah. Uh, yeah Charles yeah. Doubting. And because he, he has a new book out right now, two books at the same time, one oh, for grownups, yeah. one for kids. <laughs> and um yeah, and and his whole thing is about uh, no dig gardening, which of yeah. course Ruth Stout was sort of the progenitor of all of that back in the day. And there's there's a lot of information out there, <clears throat> garden there, nerds, if yeah. you want to go in that in and that all direction. It's great. That's the thing. Whether you do no dig, no till, the whole premise is to let that soil do its thing and have the relationship with the plant roots and everything, and keep the aggregates in their place and keep the bacteria in its place and that's all really important. So no matter what you do, if, that, if that's your aim, that's going to be a, like a super great goal. So how right. whatever you do is is fabulous with that. Excellent. All yeah. right. Now it is tip time. And I know you just said that maybe that no dig thing was your tip, but do you have perhaps another tip you'd like to share with the garden nerd audience? I'm trying to think about what you know, I, I, I don't know if I have specific tips. Um, you know, one of the things I really like to do, though, with my garden beds, I just thought this is an interesting thing that I do. And I actually mentioned it in the book, um, but it's called pre-sprouting. And oh, yeah, Talk about that. I, I love to do this. OK, like it just gives us really deep satisfaction. OK, so so you set up that garden bed. It's all going on. Everything's great. You're not planting into it yet, but you start watering and you start acting as if. And then these little plants start to come up and they're weeds. Uh -huh. and it's really fun when they get like when they get their first set of leaves or whatever I take what they call well everybody out there calls it a um a, what do you call it a scuffle hoe or a hula hoe you know, yeah a hula hoe, right mm -hmm. we call it the hoe of death that's what it's been <laughs> here for 20 years we just call it the hoe of death oh, and yeah. it's so great we just run that hoe and remember your garden's all fresh and awesome like like it always happens in the beginning of the year and you're thinking this year's all gonna be perfect and you know but you're out there and you just just scrape that thing along there and then you wipe them all out. Mm -hmm. And you could even do that one more time if you wanted, depending on how early you started and when you wanted to get your plants in. But I'll tell you, you get rid of a lot of weeds from the get-go doing this. I mean, it's like, so, so it's really fun. It's just like, ha, I killed you all, you know. So it's a very, <laughs> it's very satisfying, you know, like you, you know, so I really like to do that. And I think it's really helpful. So especially like in a garden bed situation, a um, little bit different if it was a perennial bed, but I'm just talking about your your basic annual vegetable beds and stuff. Um, it works very well. So yeah, that, and I have to say, the do no till boys. So, that, that's a great tip. And and I have to say when, when um, I'm loading in my own compost into the garden beds, if I've got a slow pile that was a, you know, like a cold, a cold pile, right. inevitably you end up with a million tomato seeds popping up, <laughs> yeah. you know, little seedlings. The volunteers. <laughs> and, and while tomato volunteers are the best thing in the world, you can't have 50 of them in one two by four bed. So, you know, that hula ho comes in handy. And just to describe the hula ho, it is 
also called a stirrup hook because it looks like a stirrup on a saddle um you know where it's got kind of a square outline and it's a flat blade that goes in a rectangle and it's sort of sharp on both sides of that rather than just on one end uh, so you can just run it it sort of cuts things off right below the soil surface so the roots are still in place you're not disturbing the soil but it does cut off the part of the plant that undergoes photosynthesis so it ends up right you know killing everything off it which can't is survive <laughs> right and I, it's really yeah. I, it's my favorite tool right after it rains and there's a bazillion weeds coming up everywhere yeah. it's really great it's to do great. and yeah. and if you have mulch it just kind of cuts through the mulch and it doesn't displace it too much so you don't end up with a big trench at one end of your row and you know it still okay. kind of leaves everything where it should be it does it really does it does not disturb much at all and and yet you really did a good job with your weeding there <laughs> yeah <laughs> before they get to a point where you're out there going oh dang it yeah taking them and whatever so yeah, <laughs> yeah. i and love it yeah and with all the rain we've had lately here in california i think everyone's going to need to invest in a yeah. hula hoe yeah <laughs> right well, thank you so much, Chris, for that thank great you. tip and for being a guest on the podcast. Uh, where should people go to find you? Um, right at the moment, uh, my website, which is laughingcrowco.com. Um, we are working on another website right now, but sadly, it won't be live till about June. So it's, uh, I wish I could, you know, put that out there. But uh, so I don't spend a whole lot of time on my website, but you can always reach me through my website. It comes, you know, everything comes directly to me and everything. So that's just my farm website. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll have this other thing going soon and that'll be fun. And I'll talk about it on the farm website. So uh, people can go over and check it out. And yeah. And any social media that you like people to follow? Uh, you know, Instagram is Laughing Crow Co. So the handle is that as well. But Facebook, way back in the day, way, way back in the day, when I was in suburbia, um, I was a suburban farmer. And uh, so that's my handle on Facebook if you want to find me. But also I think Chris McLaughlin would also pop me up. But that's the handle is suburban farmer. Got it. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, suburbia is where we yeah. all were, you know, we get started. All right, Garden Nerds, you'll find a link to Chris's website this week at gardennerd.com. We'll also post links to her social media feeds and where to find her book. That's it for this week. Subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Visit us for tons of free gardening information at gardennerd.com. Consider becoming a Patreon subscriber to support all the free stuff that we do here at Garden Nerd. And you'll find us on Instagram and Twitter under gardennerd1, on Facebook as gardennerd.com, and of course, our Garden Nerd YouTube channel. Happy gardening!